thank you for doing this with me. So the, the whole idea here is to, to have another um, conversation uh, with deep digital friends, which I consider two of you to, to be very uh, close in that. And it's interesting that my last talk three years ago was with Alexander. And then uh, Alka asked me to come and uh, work for their project. So I've been deep diving the past three years uh, into this project that Alka has. And um, I, I both feel that both of you have a very good understanding of what deep digital means as a, as a, as a new way of thinking and a new way of being able to do whatever. Right, basically, so that's me. Um, I, I want to uh, get each of you ask you to, to introduce yourself and, and um, whatever you want, right? So uh, let's give the floor to Alexander. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. And uh, Oke okay and I are evidence that the Rasputin look is back in fashion. So, yes, if you, you want to look smart these days, if you want to look intelligent and fight the machines, you have to look like Rasputin. So, they, we, we're obviously evidence for that. So, gray beards rule the world. Here we go. Exactly. Uh, I'm in between books. I published Prats and Events with John Sedeckis last year, our sixth book. And uh, I'm probably going to start writing a seventh book, even with John again. We'll see next year. Uh, I'm doing some music this year in between, but I love being a philosopher. I'm intensely interested in humanity. And the more the machines take over the world, the more interested in man I become. So the more interested in humans I become. And I think I'm operating towards kind of a phenomenology of time for the digital age or something like that in my next book. But that's the kind of work that I do. So that's I'm in between Hegel and Nietzsche, dancing as well as I can. And I'm also a big fan of Eastern spirituality and philosophy. So that's where I'm looking. OK. And uh, I'm Alko Hoekstra. I'm uh, mainly known as, uh, as a researcher of the energy transition. So uh, I make agent-based models that sort of predict how and where we will see, well, be put very bluntly, how we will see uh, sun and wind and batteries and renewable energy take over the world and give us abundant uh, and cheap energy forever and vanquish climate change. But we have to do it as quickly as possible. And, and for that, I do modeling at the University of Eindhoven, where I have a research initiative. And I have my own company that does that on a smaller scale for all kind of uh, uh, small business areas where they basically want to optimize their energy use um, uh, within grid constraints. That's what pays the bills, to be quite honest, because I'm too much of a boundary worker to, to be really in high demand. And I, I like it that way, to, to sort of be independent. And to be quite honest, um, I hadn't heard of Alexander yet, <laughs> although of course I knew the song, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but as a philosopher, and I find it sometimes hair raising and sometimes deeply interesting. So, uh, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I have no idea yet, yet where we're going to end up, but um, as, as, as a, maybe a teaser, I'm very interested in, in, in seeing how we can maybe apply synthetism, uh, synthetism to energy transition? Can we maybe give meaning to some, so, so, such a large event in your terms as a transition that we're, where we're in uh, maybe uh, uh, through, uh, yeah, I would say inventing God, inventing meaning. Uh, uh, how do we do that? So that, that's really something that, 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 that bugs me a lot because I think we need some sort of religion. But I also think that the current religions are, are, aren't, aren't maybe they're not the, the right choice uh, tools for the job. And I'm also super interested in uh, the idea of process and events and, um, um, well, to be quite, quite honest, monism. And how you how 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 somebody who should be a monist and who who's so into emergence etc. And I think we should study this as emergence uh, ended up with so so Drazen. So that that's some stuff that's bouncing around in my head and uh, looking at your stuff so to speak. But anyway, um, maybe yeah, we I, should. I, I, I can start. At the end. I can start at the end and I can explain that Zoroastrianism is formerly a religion. Consider religion, although it is philosophy. So Rastus themselves called it as Mazda Yasmi in the ancient Persian, that means lovers of wisdom. Uh, the term was then stolen by the Greeks 1200 years later. The Greeks stole quite a lot from a lot of people. Uh, and, and they returned it philosophia, which is exactly the same term, but in Greek. Uh, so uh, to be a Zoroastrian is to convert to philosophy, as is philosophy, it's a religion. 
And uh, what's interesting with Zoroastrianism in this conversation is that they invented ecology. They invented ecology 1700 before Christ, meaning basically that human, the human relationship to the world must be exploitative rather than exploitative. Basically, it's just like you can't use the resource that you're not going to put back. And, and the point here is that everything is circular. So in my work, I'm, I'm working a lot with circularity, which is, of course, the basis of ecology. And the funny thing is that ecology and circularity are way older ideas, actually the, the original ideas of philosophy, and rather ideas of creating perfect worlds and, and, and you know, platonic forms or whatever you want to call it that come later in philosophy are actually the theories we need to get rid of, right? Uh, in my work, I'm, I'm basically cleaning out the axial age, as it's called, you know, from about a thousand years before Christ until about 500 years after Christ. That period called the axial age, we have a lot of philosophers that produce a lot of thinking, but a lot of the thinking they produce is what we now would consider to be exploitative thinking. Basically, we don't have any constraints as human beings. We can use whatever resources we have on this planet as much as we like. And of course, that worked until finally it all collapsed with us. And basically, yeah, yeah, it was yeah. the internet. It was the internet and the satellites that basically told us 30, 40 years ago, oops, something is going on, which is rapidly changing and is a direct result of... I just want to interrupt you very shortly yeah. while we are um, 1700 before Christ, because I watched uh, a, a, a podcast uh, or something uh, where you were in, Men Who Saved the West, which I largely disagree with and uh, sometimes very much agreed with. And you mentioned uh, Franco Pan during that podcast and got me interested in him in, in Silk Roads. But then I read Silk Roads and I found a little bit predictable. Well, it, it wasn't completely my cup of tea, but then I found this book's book, How the World Made the West. Amazing book. Amazing book. And quick, yeah. uh, what she really Special describes book. here yeah. very well as someone who has been teaching students for God knows how many decades that the Greeks and the, the Romans invented everything, basically, because that was ancient uh, history is, is, is largely about. The whole West, which is, of course, most important, comes from a uh, Greek and, and, and a Roman. And she says, I want to explain where the Greek and the Romans came from. And it's largely Syria that you then uh, find the source of, of, of low stuff. So just just via a circular route maybe <laughs> uh, found a lot of uh, a lot of uh, super interesting history that supports what you just said yeah great exactly they're, they're both great books both frank upon and justin yeah. are amazing historians well yeah. worth reading highly recommended yeah. Yeah. yeah so the point the point i was trying to make is that one of the reasons i did convert to religion which is 1700 years older than christianity i think christianity and islam probably are part of the mix where we've exploited the planet the way we've done Obviously, the West is, is largely guilty of then basically creating a model that the East has copied, which is the way we produce technology and then produce industry and then pollute the earth. And basically, we go towards extinction unless we stop it. So the whole idea is now to redo philosophy, starting from circularity as first principle. And then from circularity as first principle, which is process, we can then start thinking event. What would it mean, for example, if there was an event that put an entire constraint on human activity, planetary entire constraint? which we call the principle of exploitation, And the principle of exploitation is if we do anything on this planet that makes it impossible for our children to continue living on this planet, it's dead wrong. And that must be the fundament for international law. More than yeah. anything, it must be the fundament for international law. There must be a planetary international law, and this international law must be built very loosely but firmly on the principle of exploitation. Yeah, and I, of course, in, in, in principle, agree with that. But I'm uh, very much a pragmatist. Uh, and I think uh, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit if we just can convince people that there's actually better and easier and cheaper and, of course, superior ways to do it than using the exploitative method that was already sort of bouncing up against a lot of limits, which gives a lot of friction, unhappy young people, but also many people dying, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So... I really believe that the, the, the and I, I thought it, was, it would be fun to think of it as an event, that the change towards, uh, well, something else after fossil fuel, I think it's, it's wind and solar, I think it's pretty bloody obvious but now, but if somebody says, oh, I really want it to be nuclear, well, whatever, but uh, uh, the, 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 the switch basically from burning 
something that nature produced, which is by itself very limited. We, we, we are using our fossil fuels about 100,000 times faster than they were produced. So it, it doesn't take a genius to say that that's, uh, that's uh, not an, uh, something that you can keep, keep up forever. And replace it basically with solar, which, well, at least gives us, let's say, a billion years extra or something. So maybe we can find something extra to something, something way out in that time or whatever. I think that is fundamentally an event. And, and it's also interesting for me. Uh, you say you're, you're a right wing Marxist, right? Uh, or, or well, it, 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 I like to provoke. I call myself an extreme right Marxist. And I do. Yeah. Think I and I thought it would be fun. Hey, if it, concerts, that's right. Okay. Yeah. I, I, and I, and I, I, I thought it be, would be fun. I'm forced I to being it, extreme right as a Marxist because the only place a Marxist can be in today is probably in the extreme right. I think Slava Shishik actually agrees with me. He's a Marxist too. So that's why I say that. that why you yes, that. yes, yes, yes. And I, I think it would be fun to sort of position myself then as, I'm not extremely, but as a left-wing capitalist. I think capitalism is, is a great way to, way to distribute basically things that people need, uh, use the greed, use the, 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 the bottom-up uh, uh, initiative of many people to, to provide for each other. But really, you need some boundaries. You need some form of of guidance, you need some, I'm not saying a, a, a philosopher king, and I, I hope you agree with that because that's Plato, of course, but yeah, I, I, I do think we need together think about how we, let's say, constrain uh, uh, capitalism in such a way that it really serves its purpose because it's not all part. So I think of myself as a left-wing capitalist, I thought it was a, a nice sort of counterpoint to your right-wing Marxism, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> Well, you know, Marx loved capitalism, so <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. He was trying to think what could be improved, in what way could capitalism be replaced so that the problems with capitalism could be replaced, which is actually what we're doing right here. We're talking about ecological capitalism. That's exactly what we're discussing here. Okay. Um, so so I, I think that the number one thing is to acknowledge what capitalism actually did and did well which is that capitalism got rid of a lot of bullshit with the human systems. You could basically stand in any street corner anywhere in the world and try to sell any kind of shit to anybody and claim anything you'd like before capitalism came along. Because when capitalism came along, a child could look up to you and ask, yeah, but what does it cost? And that would reveal how you truly valued something. So what you introduced into the global system was basically a sort of neutral valuation between things that you could actually do. So you could put a value of products and services and people. So, so, so let me, let me, let me, let me just, uh, so, so basically you're saying that capitalism is in a way like writing or something. It's a tool it's that's a, very it's useful. It's definitely an event, definitely a mass yeah. event. It came out of the printing press, which is the real event in 1450. And that's why Europe got big head and thought we were the center of the planet because the Europeans had the printing press. Now, with the printing press came the Enlightenment and came the printing of paper money and out of Venice grew capitalism, which made the trade routes, previous trade routes, like the Silk Road, look like nothing compared to the new global trade routes we created. Now, that created enormous amounts of wealth around the planet. There's no, no doubt about that. Karl Marx agreed firmly. Mm -hmm. The problem is that it did so on the condition that the planet was exploited. And the planet was exploited. It didn't matter much until we finally, yeah, we didn't we didn't want to have the gas down our lungs. So we died from cancer earlier, a lot more in the past. We got sick a lot faster. Our lives were shorter. But we did improve on health and things like that during capitalism as well. So capitalism tried to compensate through innovation with the very problems capitalism was also creating. Now, finally, the, the, the problems of capitalism became so big, it started taking over the entire scene. Over the last 50 years, there's been this massive event this enlightenment, which is called ecology. And ecology is basically that we realize that the planet in itself is its own sphere, as Slaughterdite says. Exactly. And within this sphere, this sphere has to be kept alive for generations to come. I think we all agree on that. And then the problem is that, well, if somebody's cheating and still exploiting the planet, then somebody else would cheat too. The problem now is to try to create a system where nobody exploits the planet because the neighbor is exploiting the planet. And that's fiendish and difficult, but it's absolutely necessary. Exactly, exactly, exactly. What do you think of degrowth? No, I don't think that I, I, I find that deeply problematic. Number one, that idea usually comes from people who don't understand economics. And I am an economist by training. I'm a huge fan of Milton Friedman. What I'm saying growth is that it's going to require growth to go solar and to go wind and to possibly also go efficient fusion power and to save ourselves without burning fossil fuels. It, it will require growth to do it, I would say. But I'm not pro or against growth per se. I'm pro quality of life. I'm uh, just to, just to reflect life. on that, I'm, I'm glad we are on the same page here because I yeah. think 
degrowth uh, is also it's very much focused on GDP, which who cares? Yeah. Uh, uh, so I think we should grow as human beings. Our understanding should grow. Our education. There's so many things we can grow that doesn't cost any any resources at all. It doesn't uh, uh, threaten any uh, planetary boundaries, and a lot of other uh, growth indeed, like solar and wind, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, is uh, yeah is the good kind of growth is is growth that basically automatically leads to diminishment somewhere else where there's more problem like so i'm looking this as very much an engineer but i found that especially french people by the way but a lot of degrowth uh, proponents somehow find this yeah they, they say you're a techno optimist you you, you and, and it's a really bad thing by the way uh, being a techno optimist or or, or 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 having all kind of technological solutions where Whereas I have to be very honest, I'm I'm a little bit skeptical that I can change human nature in a, in a hurry. I think that that's going to take time, even culture, etc. And of course, we don't have to fly. Of course, we don't have to eat. There's a lot of stuff we don't have to do. But it's very hard to stop to make people not doing that. And I think, and actually substituting, for example, a normal car by an electric car, etc. That, that's relatively easy. So. That's where I come from, but a lot of yeah, I, I, economists if, if, disagree. If, if you talk to somebody from India or China, for example, okay, and you talk about degrowth, they smack you in the face. Yeah, that's a luxury belief, a luxury position only a few very decadent Europeans and Americans take. I but agree. They they wouldn't want to live in a poorer world. They wouldn't want to be poor themselves. No, they want their fucking luxuries anyway. See, it, it start. That's exactly what our reactor said. I don't discuss economics unless you've met, read Milton Friedman first and get how economics actually operates. An economy is neighbor with ecology. There's a reason why the terms are very similar. An economy is an important key key component in the proper ecology. So it's all about, for example, we do have taxation, we do have governments, and law is easier to change than humans. Totally agree with you. Humans no. will not change very rapidly. But human beings, for example, have strong inclinations towards religion and spirituality. So when I do ecology, I go into the world of religion and spirituality and I address it as religious or spiritual questions, because not because I believe people will change per se the behavior, but they'll be open to the fact that governments will change and law will change accordingly. And the thing but, but with can you can you can you tell a little yeah. bit more about that? Because no, so, 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 so that what the you thing. just said, if, yeah. if I may, what you just said is if I talk about ecology, I go into religion and I uh, more or less dress it up, maybe a little bit or, 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 or I use maybe the, the tools uh, that religion uh, provided or or people, how people are drawn to 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 to, to kind. Of, so so for, for me, but let, let's just define what religion is. For, for me, actually, I like spirit, spirituality better than religion. For me, religion uh, refers to how you organize it. And often there comes a lot of power play, et cetera, et cetera. That's not so nice as far as I'm concerned. But spiritually, in an essence, as far as I see it, is a way of collective meaning creation. So you create shared meaning. And I think uh, people really need that. And I think ecology has sort of the components that 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 could could that you could use for 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 meaning making, but just as a as an academic discipline, it doesn't have what it takes, so to speak. Uh, so, so that's what you trigger to me. Do you have any? No, I mean, but art and religion are not academic disciplines at all. They're practices. They to me the practices and and the personal practice that I have myself in my meditation and my yoga every day and all that is really meaningful to me. And you know what? When I come out of the meditation session in the morning, it's really hard to be not to think ecologically about the world and what I could do and what, what my footprint is or whatever. It it comes natural once you have a spiritual practice. So that's usually a good place to start. I I don't have a problem with the word religion, but I'm a philosopher. I'm supposed to use words that provoke. And sometimes religion is actually better than spirituality because it is more provoking as a word. Uh -huh. But I'll tell you the vision here. The vision in process and events that we're interested in here is called the Garden of God. And I use God here only strictly theologically. You don't have to worry about the existence of God or anything at all. It's just that God is the word in, in theology and philosophy for the ultimate horizon, like the absolute. So we could say goddess if you want to then refer to planet Earth. That's what a lot of people are doing. Usually we think of, of Earth as divine feminine and we think of sky as divine masculine. We've always done that anthropologically the way we see the world. So the garden of God is basically saying, I'm totally with you on technology. I think, I think it's really, really, it's really dangerous to go against technology per se because technology has created enormous wealth and be very successful. But technology also produced problems we got side problems that also occurred. They can be corrected with law and technology, definitely. So here's the trick. The Garden of God is really looking at the agricultural revolution that started from 8,000 years ago. 
And then it's thinking like the cultural evolution, because with agriculture, we really try to imagine that we turn wild wilderness, wild nature, into something control as human beings. And the thing is that we turn nature into culture, or culture as nature 2.0, as we call it in our work. Now, when nature 2.0 is, of course, necessary to do agriculture and to do large scale agriculture and support 8 billion people on the planet, we've certainly done that. But the revolution itself, the agricultural revolution, that event is incomplete because the thing we must do, for example, to avoid the next ice age, if we take that horizon, we have to consider the entire planet as a garden that we share as human beings and must withhold. Now, if we start thinking the planet as a garden, and a garden is cultured, it's cultured nature. The wilderness is also in itself, you know, even in the 18th mm -hmm. century, the English built gardens that pretended to be wilderness, you know, so even the wilderness itself, national parks and things we have are contained by humans. Now, if you think of the entire planet as one solid garden, we got mm -hmm. what I call the garden of God. And just like we, if we complete the urbanization process and capitalism and industrialism, we will start thinking the city of God, which is how do 8 billion people get along without going to war? Now, these are the horizons philosophers think. So for me, I come from the garden of God, which is a huge perspective spanning over tens of thousands of years. And then I go down to look at the acute problems we have right now, for example, with climate change and, and, and the causes and effects that are going on. And then we can start looking at proper technological uh, evolutions that have to occur and how we can encourage those. That, that's, that's the bigger philosophical picture. Be beautiful. Be it, 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 maybe it's uh, typical that I often call this spaceship Earth, but yes. it's basically the same, or Gaia, uh, Gaiaism, right? And and do you also think, by the way, that in in, in a way that when the rocket, you know, uh, went to uh, went to the moon and made the first picture of the Earth, that that could in itself maybe be a kind of an event that kicked off this new way of of of, of, of maybe kicked off the philosophy of the Garden of uh, of, of God. Oh yeah, the old Heidegger, the old Heidegger wrote a piece in 1958, precisely when he saw the first picture from outer space, and said, this is an event for the human imagination. We have never yeah. seen ourselves from the outside world. And what we're seeing is a stunningly beautiful planet in a very cold, dark, massive Exactly, universe. exactly. And that, that really has become, just like the bomb, Hiroshima, August 6, 1945 was the creation of the devil. We know since August 6, 1945, that we can blow ourselves up. And the bomb is still the ultimate horizon in the sense that we immediately could kill ourselves using the bomb. Then came climate. And I think demographics is going to come in the next 20 years as an issue on a par with the bomb and the climate crisis. Because demographics is going to cause enormous problems for us that we didn't see 50 years ago when we all were terrified of overpopulation. And it's actually the other way around, historically. Demographic is going to be an intense problem we need to deal with the next 10 years. It's going to shock through the system. It's going to shock the current political ideologies at the very foundation. And we philosophers have to deal with those things. So the bomb and the climate and the demographic crisis are three things that we need to deal with, all three of them. Yeah, totally agree. So um, it's it's kind of interesting to, if I can jump in, that, mm -hmm. that um, uh, so we have these events. Um, and the events are like, um, but we also have all, all the time the processes, right? But once you have this event, the, the way the processes used to work are changing. And I've noticed that um, um, people uh, who, who have a better understanding of recursive thinking, like uh, which like most software developers are trained in recursive thinking, but the two of you are also very trained in, in this, this recursive kind of thinking. So that's what I what I focus on when I say deep digital. <clears throat> and and so, but the, the, the whole digital thing is something that has been happening now for the past century, basically, almost, right? And while I, I have the feeling that both of you are looking at an event that is like happening right here, right now. And so I, I'm wondering, how will that change the, our processes? How, I'd, say how would we... the, I'd say the events are themselves neutral. This is the perfect example here. The bomb we blew up in August 1945 or Hiroshima changed history forever. We got okay. the pictures. We were okay. terrified. And we realized we could blow ourselves up at any given moment, especially when the bomb started spreading, right? Major problem, not solved. The very same power that slowed over Hiroshima is now being used at least partly solve the crisis with fossil fuels. This is a pharmacon to 
an important word in the history of philosophy. Pharmacon means that something is neutral. It can be good there or it can be bad there. It depends on how we use it. And that's down to us as humans. And I give you a perfect example of what I'm terrified of. What I'm terrified around with the climate crisis is that we're going to prolong implementing the necessary law regulations and motivations for people to innovate to actually deal with the climate crisis in time. Because if we don't deal with the climate crisis in time, the terrifying philosopher king that Oka mentioned before is probably going to come along and say, I'll deal with the climate crisis for you. But to do that, I want a global dictatorship. I want a, a, a total surveillance police state. And for me, as a philosopher, that's over and done with for me. It makes my life totally horrible. So if that happens, if that were to happen, it will be the result. If the climate crisis isn't dealt with properly in time, I'm sure we're going to have that philosopher king step forward suddenly saying, I'll solve the problem for you. I'll save humanity, but at the cost of running a fucking surveillance police state. So, yeah. so, this, so again, what we're doing now with solar wind power, et cetera, what we're doing now with fission and hopefully with fusion power eventually, yes, they're events. They're fantastic events in the sense to create the capacity for us to save the planet, have more abundant, cheap energy than ever before. And energy is the bottom of everything human beings do. Now, that, that's possible. But it's also possible that the very technologies we're currently developing, for example, digital surveillance, can be used, can use the climate crisis as an excuse to implement the kind of society that would be horrible to us. So it's a yeah. pharmacon. It's us, it's up to us as humans in time to make the and, necessary decision. And, and then we I, de and we delay those decisions, uh -huh. that's where we get the horror, right? And 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 if I can I follow up on that uh, uh, because um, what my hope is in a way is that one thing that most of us share, I think uh, in almost all cultures, is that we value this earth, that we value mother earth, that we think this is, it's actually nice to live on this planet and, and, and we should keep it nice for our children, etc. cetera. I, I don't think there's many people say, no, I have a principal problem with that. I think we should ruin the earth and make it unlivable for our children. That's my philosophical, st philosoph philosophical stance. Right, so so this is something, and I, I actually think also if you look at religions, etc., there's usually something about basically uh, caring for Mother Earth because she cares for us, blah blah blah, that, that that sort of thing. Wouldn't it be nice if we reframed climate change not as basically a war from people who who like to use pronouns and are left wing and 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 and, 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 and dislike fossil fuels and and make it a culture war thing? And who wanders poor, et cetera, et cetera, versus the people uh, who the do gooders, et cetera, who, who know better, which I'm probably more or less part of. But wouldn't it be nice to say, look, I respect that you see the world very differently than I do. And I think this is also something that's very much missing on social media, simply accepting that somebody else thinks differently about the world. They are Republican, they are right-wing Marxists. They are whatever they are, right? And it's fine. That's why what my mother always told me. People at a certain moment have a certain belief system and you have to accept that. It's their God, or whatever, right? You're not going to change that. So isn't it, wouldn't it be nice to say, hey, these, this energy transition, so what I'm working for, right? Let's, let's show to people that whatever their belief system is, if they think the world is gonna should be a better place tomorrow, simply simply from energy flows, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not saying, saying anything about how you treat different sexes or 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 or, or, or social conservatism, whatever, whatever. Simply, you can get cheaper energy, and it will not harm the world. Will you join me? Something like that, and 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 then package that in in something that resonates with different people. And that's what I meant also with religion and. I also think, by the way, that, that this fits into it, that, that what you're describing um, uh, uh, with, with syncretism and, and with basically how we are uh, uh, creating God. And also, if, so if I think of emergence, right, I think about that basically you can study a human as different cells, but hey, it's much interest, more, more interesting to study a human as a complex of cells. <laughs> Because then it has, well, it's something that we think is consciousness. I don't know what it is or free will. I don't know what it is. But anyway, we, we sort of see it. We can study it. It's interesting. I think if we put all people together, and especially in the modern internet uh, age, we can see that there's something that's bigger than all of us. We created it ourselves. 
maybe we can treat that as God, and, and maybe we shouldn't call it that, but, 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 but maybe it's a good start for a new religion, maybe, if we are aware well, that this well, thing we, we created okay, together. Okay, we do have a problem, because people actually do disagree with you here. The problem okay, is that okay. you got into Islam, both for the last 1,500 and 2,000 years, they preached that this was not the end of life, because there was an afterlife. And with the afterlife belief comes the belief that this planet will go down and will be replaced by some kind of new divine creation that will suddenly just appear from out of nowhere and angels will rise down and there will be a new earth. The problem is that Western thinking, and Western thinking is both Middle East and European thinking. The West is anything west of the Gobi Desert. That's why I've, I've always, like Joseph and Quinn and Franco Pandu, I insist that the West is anything west of the Gobi Desert. Islam and Christianity come from the same life world and very similar ideas. And the problem with these mass religions was that they actually did preach that you could exploit the planet. And the very culture today on the planet that exploited the most per, per average citizen, for example, Americans and Russians, are full of these ideas still, that they can exploit the earth as much as they like and they don't have to stop exploiting it because it will go down anyway. The Armageddon will come and it will be replaced and then we'll have a new earth. And some people out. actually so actually try to that's accelerate try to yes. accelerate that moment. Indeed. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm warning, the current crisis in the Middle East could easily be a self-fulfilling prophecy when finally Islam and Christianity get the fucking Armageddon they've been asking for. That's how yeah. terrifying this is. <laughs> So we yeah. philosophers, we have that problem. <laughs> Sorry, <clears throat> I got excited here. Yeah. We philosophers have the problem that, no, I cannot treat every opinion out on equal basis. We have to fundamentally demand that employation is something everybody has to agree on. This is difficult. But, 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 but still, but still, if, 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 if I can just jump into what you just said, ju just right? because it's, it's interesting, I think, to, 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 to focus on this a little bit further, because indeed um, uh, exploitation is basically at the root. Well, uh, uh, heaven will make it right. For now, you just and actually Armageddon, if it comes sooner, uh, uh, and that's uh, that's all the, all the better, so to speak. But that's a pretty small minority within Christianity, and I would say probably also pretty small minority within uh, Islam. Certainly within Christianity, so evangelicals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But most people I talk to. Even the, the the ones that 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 say I'm Christian or uh, I, I'm Islamic will say no 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 that that's that's one way to see it but that's a very narrow of course we don't you know so I think a lot of people like the idea of religion also for traditional reason because their parents liked etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's a social phenomenon I don't say I don't think there's a lot of people say well I actually practice religion and I can't wait for them again I think that's a, a pretty small group. So maybe no, it's not a small group at all. It's 33% no? of all Americans. It's the majority of Russians. It's the majority of people in the Middle East. And no, there are quite a that. few people in Western Europe are now changing religion. That's exactly what's happening, especially women are changing religion. Women do not wear Christ on the cross any longer in most of Europe. Outside of Poland, women are basically stopped wearing the cross across. Instead, they have Buddha statues and candle lights just about everywhere. We are actually changing religion. We are changing because of ecology. It's precise ecology, which subconsciously right now is the collective force that is changing, is making us change religion because we're going back to thinking circularity and we want the spirituality that encourages circularity. And people mm -hmm. are actually including an ecological mindset in their spiritual practices. Yeah, but but Perhaps isn't that, isn't that, isn't that, that but, but, yeah, but, but, but are. Uh, this move to ecology is not exactly a move to, uh, um, uh, to, to, to looking for Armageddon, right? So, so. The, those people are moving away from the exploitation exactly, thinking. Exactly, exactly. Right? So ecology is it's a good sign in the world of religion and spirituality yeah. simply because it takes people away from thinking the afterlife. So I do not agree that I can accept an opinion out there as an equal with mine except the people out there. We have huge minorities that are loud and very powerful. And these mm -hmm. huge minorities are pumping up the gas in the oil field and they live like there's no tomorrow because they come from a mindset where this earth will go down and be replaced by a new one. It, it really is a very, very common conception. So to get out of that mindset, well, at least now Europe, we have the debate. We also have to make the move. We have to practice it. But I am totally, I think Western technology and Eastern spirituality is a really good mix. Because exactly. Eastern spirituality, the vast majority of Eastern spiritual schools will teach you that the world is fundamentally a process and it's circular. And we have to go back to circular here and then add the event to the circle. That's why the book is called Process and Event. Process yeah, 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 yeah. And event. So, yeah. so, so I, I, when you described it, I, I, I thought, oh, but I'm uh, especially interested in, for example, evolutionary processes, 
And of course, evolutionary process is not completely cyclic. It's largely cyclic because mm -hmm. we, but still we change a little bit over time and, and, and that change. So it's a cycle that goes, well, any direction you like, <laughs> whatever, but, but, but. Uh, you're, so, you're very philosophical here. That's exactly the point. This is deal mm -hmm. diverse in a nutshell. But the repetition is not identical. The repetition with every loop, the repetition is slightly different. And that difference enables us humans to imagine the world differently. So what we do is, for example, if you work with technology and you love to innovate and create new technologies, in this case, you love to create really good ecological technologies. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Eco technologies, what do you want to create? If you want to do that, what you do, Elke, then what you do is that you think, how can this loop that I'm working with be slightly different the next time and go in a certain mm -hmm. direction? And that's what an event is. That's exactly what an event is. So you have micro events that eventually turn into a huge event. And those events can eventually even become an emergence in history in the sense that something radically changes history forever. And the day we have achieved the circular society we're talking about here, the day we have a, 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 a global society that actually works according to the principle of rotation, okay, we said, Ooh, at least that problem now has been solved and we can move on to other But problems. then let, let me be devil's advocate here because of course I agree, but this is boring uh, to just agree. <laughs> um, I think that a lot of people who sort of are embracing this circularity are very much enraged by this idea of, for example, making something happen on Mars or, you know, these kind of things that, that, that look like events that sort of disturb the, the sort of circularity. Whereas... I, uh, maybe partly because I'm an engineer, I like that sort of stuff, but uh, although I'm not officially an engineer, but any, anyway, uh, I think uh, everybody I spoke to who tried to make a living habitat out of Earth appreciates the hell out of life on Earth. They know how good we have it here. The, I, I know nobody, to be quite honest, who is interested in Mars, for example, who isn't completely down with ecological thinking. They know how important it is to 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 get this this this, this life support system uh, uh, ready. So I think it's also a little bit boring and even oppressive sometimes that people are going. No, you can just I don't insulate, use less energy. I think that's also where a large part of the support for degrowth comes from. By by the way, basically you want to stay in the, in the, in the same process. You don't want things to change at all, and and and, and not technology and invention and, 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 and innovation and, and, and strange new things and God knows. So how can we have both? Be happy that we sort of improve the process all the time without the people sort of, yeah. Uh, I, think, I think it is fundamentally in religion and in spirituality. Uh, if the fundamental religion is that there's a mother earth, the feminine, and there's a, a phallic sky god, which is actually where event comes from. So the, the idea is that the phallic force is the one that invents. So innovation, for example, technology comes out of the phallic. Uh, the way I phrased it is that kind of a provocative equation, but it kind of nails it. So number one, woman gives birth to child. Number yeah, two, I'm, I'm really number, unhappy about this, two, this projecting two, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Number two, man envies woman for giving birth to a child. Three, because man envies woman for giving birth to a child, man gives birth to technology. Four, because technology changes quicker than child changes. Five, technology will one day kill the child. That's a good, that's a good equation just put forward, because that is if this is all it's happening. It's a beautiful our story. It's our the, the, only, the only problem, the only... Sorry. Yeah, but if you apply our conscious involvement on that equation, then of course the last line has to be changed. Technology cannot kill the child. Okay, no. good. Then you created the constraints on technology, but you can allow technology to grow as much as you like, and you can technology to prosper. You can, you can allow any fantastic technology you like, but it must have this one constraint. It must not kill the child. Right. Yeah. So that's that's what philosophy is essentially. It's dealing yeah, with these yeah, yeah. big yeah, I, I, I have I I I, 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 I think we should be very yeah. Careful to at least uh, uh, make very clear that we talk about when we talk about a male and a female, this is the archetype. Yeah. Nothing, nothing about the sex or whatever, whatever. I mean, um, um, uh, the, the woke youngsters have a point there that it has to be it often uh, is is a little bit orthodox in its interpretation. Like, no, uh, I, if, think I think they're wrong. OK, this is where we disagree. I think it's fundamental. I, think, I don't think the woke kids are teaching us anything right now to save the planet. I think they're completely lost. I don't think the solution is there at all. So this is where we actually do disagree. I, 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 know, I know, I know. Although, I, although I think, I'm, I think I'm masculine old enough. are fantastic principles and they actually make sense to people in storytelling. And in a way, they actually operate that way. There's 
there's, there's, there is a masculine and feminine attitude towards, and they're equal, two forces, but they're equal. And to apply them on to the planet and to the life and to save us, it actually makes sense. For example, you're going to be in China, you try to disqualify yourself from using yin and yang, nobody will listen to you. Because nothing you say will make any sense because it's so fundamental in Chinese culture. And the yang is split, the yang and the yang, etc. So you, you do the yin and the yang schedule, you, you schema, to then talk to the Chinese. And they're doing ecology quite a lot at the moment. And that's exactly why they're doing it. So I think it actually makes a lot of sense to use anthropology this way and use these terms. You can have citation marks if you like around the words. But if you don't dare to use these words because somebody politically correct, it politically comes in and then it just is your language, you're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to there, get anywhere. There, I hundred percent agree. I, I just yeah. wanted to. I, I just want the quotation marks, so to speak. Yeah. So if an you individual, can mark if, you like, but, if, but, if an individual just, says, "Well, I, I, I'm a male. Yeah. I'm a male, but I like the female perspective better, and that's what I'm working on." That's fine, of course, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And circularity mm -hmm. is very female. It's women who are changing religion in the West today, not men. I'm doing spiritual men's work work in men because women are way ahead of men when it comes to spirituality. Women have already switched and changed religion away from the afterlife and the Armageddon and the exploitation of the earth. Women are clearly going back into kind of a new pagan mode. Hinduism is huge. Buddhism is huge to women. What they're doing with their spirituality is that basically with the Buddha statutes and the meditation techniques and the yoga students they got is that they're really pro-ecology. You get a very solid base in the electorate right now from women who are pro-ecology. And they all have these spiritual practices as part of their package. Now it's time yeah. for men to do the same thing. But for men, we have to invent a more phallic story. And that phallic story is why don't you innovate yourself out of the crisis, which is the male story that you need to have. If we leave the quotation marks in, I'm completely fine with that. I'm also old enough to be. I just read a beautiful science fiction book. Uh, but one of the biggest things was if we invite the aliens over, what are going to be our gender pronoun badges? And I'm like, no, oh, sorry, sorry, I can't do this. I can't do this. I, 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 I'm so fine with everybody uh, doing it their own way, but 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 please don't overdo it. All the but anyway. pronouns, it's just a lack of imagination. That's what all this to it. It's just like self-identifying. No, everybody's identified socially. It's just it's just great to tell people that they have to call you certain things instead of them having to invent new names for you. Why don't have another name? It's like I work with transitions, for example. We can talk about sex change. I work with transitions because I'm a science analyst, and I'm thrilled to do it. It's very exciting. It's very very interesting. And uh, my attitude is very simple. You cannot switch from man to woman. You cannot switch from woman to man. We're inventing two new sexes called trans man and trans woman. Own them. <laughs> so that's what I'm working with constantly. Just yeah. as a philosopher, people are just people are just like stuck in these little boxes and they can't think outside of them. It's like, well, to solve problems, you invent new boxes yeah. that make yeah. sense. I, I, just with, I just worked with I just worked with 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 a boy who uh, uh, during his uh, final thesis decided he. Wanted to be a woman and then wanted to be a boy, and now he's he's, he's changing every month, and it it it, 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 it takes a little bit of getting used to. But yeah, uh, everybody's like like, what do we think of this? I think that it's fine, and now let's move on. And he's also a little bit disappointed. I sometimes think about how I'm like, well, fine, great, good for you. And uh, what was the topic? Because I I really think that that people should and and that's by the way, th th why uh, is religion often so 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 hellbound on defining this or, or 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 chaining people to a certain uh, uh, yeah uh, a certain self image. So to speak. Why don't, well, for it's, example, it's not, it's, not, it's not religion; it's ideology. I mean, whenever I hear people speak badly about religion, it's like, hey, we invented Nazism and Stalinism in the 20th century. They were not religions; they were ideologies. The problem is ideology. My spiritual oh. practice is non-dogmatic. It's a practice. I get up yeah. in the morning and do my practice. Yeah, but, but, but why, 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 are people, why are people That's so amazing. obsessed? Why are people so obsessed with defining somebody else by race, sex, whatever? I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, who cares? Do it yourself. Let me know what you, what you, what you think is nice and, and it, I'll roll with it. I think it's called narcissism and it's kind of boring. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Huh. Being self-obsessed is a boring thing. And it's actually, again, if you go back to ecology and what ecology actually teaches us, it teaches uh -huh. us that 8 billion of us humans on the planet. We might even be shrinking soon and shrinking a bit too fast, but it's 8 billion of us. And we need to create a planet which is sustainable for 8 yeah. billion for the foreseeable future. That that perspective is what I'm interested in. And it's like you said, it's a very pragmatic, down-to-earth question in everyday life, but it's a principled philosophical question for the world as a whole. 
So yeah, there's the, yeah, the global perspective, yeah. which you call ecology with the, with the capital E. And mm -hmm. then there's the local, very pragmatic ecology in everyday life that we're all taking part in. But it is the oh. new, it, this is the foundation for spirituality today. And this is what I'm doing as a philosopher. I'm attacking spiritualities that refuse to include ecology. And I did it by converting to religion that has actually implemented ecology for 3,000 years. There we are, are <laughs> totally, on the, totally on the same page. I'm trying to implement what that means in a way. And, and you try to redefine what that means philosophically if you embrace uh, ecology. But I think that's really where we're on the same page. Maybe if I may. One last question. Go ahead. Oh, are we wrapping up? Okay. Uh, no, no, uh, I don't know. It's just a very I... long question, Nixon. Okay. No, <laughs> no, no, no. no. Okay, it's, I it's, love uh, talking to each other. It's getting warmed up. Yeah. <laughs> My question is, um, I think the big difference between uh, modern generations and uh, people, uh, uh, what I've seen from, let's say, also philosophy a little bit more than 50 years ago, is that with Franz de Waal, for example, we are now, I think, able to step back and to study ourselves as apes and to say, hey, I behave this way because of certain evolutionary drives without saying I am this way, right? We, we can sort of, or, or we can cognitively make a distinction between what we observe in ourselves and, and uh, what we want to do about it. And for example, I think nudging is also a very nice example where sometimes people say, hey, if I pu always put uh, uh, food in, in, in front of me, I'm going to eat a lot, I'm going to get thick. So maybe if I just put the food a little bit, so you have a conscious trick, how in how far can we use this new, let's say meta perspective to give ecology a boost? So do I we think, know? This yeah. is a very good question because it's also about rhetoric, which is philosophical. A philosophical discipline. It's all about rhetoric and about policy and implementation, communication. For example, I live in Scandinavia. They've done a lot of nudging here. But when they don't tell you they're nudging you, people get very angry. Yes. Cool. Very. But when you are okay with it, like you, for example, self nudging, as we just discussed, don't put the food in front of you and you're, gonna, you're not going to eat as much. And put only have only the food in the fridge that's healthy for you. Don't shop food that is unhealthy because you've got to use what you have in your fridge when you mm -hmm. cook. Okay, uh -huh. so these, these principles are actually quite easy for people to implement. And for yeah. example, I work in psychiatry as a psychoanalyst. Then I work with biohacking, which is a way for young kids today to basically have an attitude towards vitamins, nutrition, training, having a good diet, etc. And some of these suffer also from psychiatric disorders that they, that they need to be treated. So we just add the psychiatric medication and small dose next to the vitamins and the minerals. And it makes sense. It's everyday habits. It's everyday habits. Yeah. I always work without moralizing about it. I think when ecology became an environmentalism, which was starting moralizing about things, we stopped technological innovation, we turned into moral issues. For example, I'm thinking every time I hear about AI, and I've been working with AI for 30 years, but every time I hear about AI, I'm just saying, unless the AI can actually go through my garbage and sort my garbage for me, so I don't have to do it myself, it's nothing. Until the day when the AI can actually sort out the garbage, it's nothing. But the day AI can sort out the garbage, everybody's going to gain from because we have very, very well sorted garbage finally, because we humans actually mis you make mistakes and we sort the garbage. So that's an example of just imagining technologies that could make our lives easier, better, and more sustainable. And I love people who, who work with these technologies in a positive, creative, constructive sense. Now, when people then steal ecology and turn it into like Christianity, be like the moral issue. Timothy Morrison, a philosopher, just written a book, which I am disgusted with, called Hell, and then it's it, in an attempt towards a Christian ecology. And I'm just like, Christianity was the problem all along. What, what, what is it that you don't get? And Morton and I totally disagree on that issue because I think Morton is a massive moralist, and I don't think that works. I think people just backfire intensely. It's very human to say, why are you trying to fool me into doing something that I'm not aware of? It's like when we go online these days, when Facebook started to flushing the ads into our faces, we left Facebook. Facebook is dead today. It killed itself because it got too cynical. I want to remove cynicism from the work of ecology, even if it's hard, because I think at the end of the day, that's just going to back. It's going to be backlash, and then we won't solve the problem. The worst, the one thing I'm terrified of besides the climate crisis police states, the other thing I'm terrified of is that people just would just get tired of the whole thing, ignore it completely, vote for anybody, let them exploit as much as they like, and just go out the door. Donald Trump is the perfect case here. So that's going to happen unless we stop nudging people when they're not aware of it. But what we're aware of, I can yeah. accept, we will totally embrace. That's a human's function.
yeah, yeah, no, that, that that's exactly my point. Yeah, so let's stop moralizing. Also, I think because it's the best way to start culture wars, etc., which are completely unconstructive. And let's just say, ah, oh, okay, so this is your opinion. Fine. Now let's. It's it's a little bit like uh, in the Netherlands we have uh, 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 even their religious right is okay with uh, 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 anti-conception, et cetera, et cetera, because then you get less abortions. It, it, it's it's that, that sort of pragmatic thinking. So so we, we Dutchmen, uh, there's a saying like uh, Americans uh, find an ideological problem to every solution, but Dutch people find a, a, a solution to every ideological problem. And, and that can go quite far sometimes where you think like, but, but, but aren't we really like completely opposite here? And it's the, no, we'll, we'll, we'll weasel away out of it and find a pragmatic solution. It sort of makes the, sort of paints the, 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 the ideological difference away or something. But I like it that way. But anyway, mm. I think Nordic, country is all, Nordic countries are also very good at that. Simply saying, well, doesn't, doesn't have, a, we are very similar in that way to, to Nordic countries. We're very pragmatic, pragmatic I, I think, often. Or would you disagree? Yeah, yeah. And when you implement ecology, that actually helps. But we also need international law eventually. We need that. Eventually. Yeah, yeah. But and, let's and do I'm ecology. The longer we wait, the longer we wait with the pragmatic solutions that are a lot less costly. But the, the, the bigger the risk is that we'll have drastic solutions, including police state surveillance state things and shit like that. We don't want. And, and if the philosopher king comes along with the climate crisis excuses, we're done. We're done. I, I as a philosopher, I'm strongly opposed to that. Which means that pragmatic solutions now, yes, and. My speeches when I talk about ecology are not, I'm not getting involved in the environmentalist agenda at all. I think it's too moralistic. It has too many problems with it. I go straight to young engineers and give speeches to them and said, ecology is the most amazing opportunity for you to create new to technologies. Here's how yeah. it works, right? That's and, where I work. And love I work yourself in the process. Eco ecology arm, I don't do the environmentalist agenda. Yeah, and that's also, by the way, the nice, uh, so, so, I often uh, I, 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 I don't envy climate uh, uh, climate scientists because they are focusing on the problem. That's their job, basically. And every year they say, they see the new problems and they talk to each other and say we have big problems. Yeah, we have big problems. And after a while, it's, I, I I I think it would be very hard for me not to get uh, depressed. I work with the young kids who actually come up with the solutions, and they say, oh yeah, that's a big problem. Yeah, we're working on it. Feels good to be working on solutions for important problems. And then they go around uh, making uh, batteries or electric vehicles, that sort of stuff. So, so I, I think uh, we should also tell young people that actually solving, see, seeing this as a problem to be solved. So no moralism at all. Simply saying, hey, don't you think we have a bit of a problem here? Well. For for different reasons, some things geopolitical, some say uh, climate change or, or, or climate refugees, some say police state, whatever. But we see a problem that we want to solve. Great, uh, get a job, make good money, and solve a problem at the same time. It will make you feel really amazing. And yeah, I think they're picking up on it. I think I'm turning you into an extreme right Marxist. Oh, you were an extreme right Marxist all along. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, I love your term left-wing capitalist. I think it's it's just as brilliant. It's actually where it's at right now. It's it's it precisely about mixing these different ways of thinking and maybe get over the whole right versus left uh, division. I, I think it's that, that is so that is low, so last century anyway. Yes, I mean if you is, look at philosophy. Ecology yeah. ecology yeah, is a problem. Wanna, oh, yeah. 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 I wanna actually pick up on that because that actually links to to how um the cha the the thought changes, right? So you, we've been talking a lot about ecology and how uh, there is a kind of a existentialism uh, that that before that. But what you, what you see is that um, uh, 150 years ago, if you would ask people uh, to think abstract, they wouldn't be able to. I mean, uh, th this is something that comes out of studies from um, 200 years of I uh, IQ studies, where you see that um, if they used to ask a question like uh, how would you act if you would uh, tomorrow wake up with a with a different sex, right? They would just simply say, "But what a bullshit! I'll, tomorrow I, I'll just be me." So they cannot really take the hypothetical serious. Uh, what I, what I hear that the to 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 get to the ecological, you need to take the circularity serious, right? You you need to think like 
uh, cause effect and circles and how that will uh, create a positive or negative feedback and how that all kind of uh, uh, triggers things. So I'm, so I'm, I'm kind of, I, I see that both of you doing that quite a lot. I wonder what is happening right now. Um, also in the debate between the two of you. Well, debate, it's more like but, uh, confirmation and debate. Lexo. Lexo, yeah. you are talking about religion. Religion is that story. It's the meta story. Yes, it's the but if you go to religion... Law. That's why I started doing theology when I started approaching mm -hmm. ecology. I think it's impossible to do ecology without talking about Mother Earth. I love the Gaia concept. I think this is brilliant. It came out of those first pictures of outer space, about our planet. The love towards the planet has to be there, has to be fundamental and constantly repeated. All those things are religious matters. That's exactly it also came from selfless. so the the idea of synthesis is basically thinking okay what if god does not exist but god could exist in the future and god is the name for the most ultimate bliss we could think of okay that is just putting an horizon out there so we have somewhere to go because if we try to deal with ecology from a nihilistic mindset it's just life is meaningless everything is meaningless and we're still going to solve ecology we will never solve ecology the way to solve ecology is basically it's going to be costly. It's going to take the best efforts of humans. It's going to be, require innovation. It's going to require critical thinking. It's going to require, require a positive, constructive mindset to solve problems to. To do that, you have to have an horizon. This is what we philosophers do. That horizon is synthesis. So the horizon is basically, let's take the God word, steal it from theology, reawaken theology, and do an echo theology. And an echo theology would say that, we could have God in the future. We humans could create God in the future and if we keep to... this planet sustainable. That's just to give engineers even more motivation to create better technology. Ecotheology, love the term. Yes. That's, they, they, we can't do ecology without doing it. Timothy Morton gets that too, but he's doing it from a moralistic, negative mindset, threatening, moralizing with his book, Hyper Objects. So if you study Timothy Morton next to Bottom Sudikson, you see two very different approaches to ecology. I think Timothy Morton is going to gain a large following as a moralist. It's like a thinking Greta Thunberg or whatever. Whereas we're doing it the other way around. I think Orca agrees on that. We're doing it by encouraging the very people who sit on the solutions to actually come up with the solutions. And that requires growth, but the proper growth of technology, but a constraint on exploitation. So if, if you prevent exploitation, moving to an employative mindset, you actually put a tax on the entire economy, but the benefit is that the economy will still be there 100 years from now, because we will still be here 100 years from now. And this is now required of us, and that's the event. The event yeah. historically is that we finally have to put a constraint on global capitalism. It has to, and we all know it, but we have to implement it in time before it all goes wrong. And it can go wrong in all kinds of directions if we wait too late. If you also go well, too hysterical and too moralistic, we're not going to do the right thing. I would actually push this even a little bit uh, further because we, 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 we have to do it before um, we get in a situation so uh, where, where, where you're too afraid to do it. I'm going to give you a, a specific example. I mean, uh, I, I've, I've seen experiments in the 1990s about social media before there was any social media. And they've done experiments that today you wouldn't be able to do because of uh, private issues and, and so on. But what I saw in, in those experiments is uh, an alternative to what we today have also, uh, as a social media that would be like almost the opposite to it. And hardly anyone knows that it's a, that, that's even an, an option. Like um, there, there was, I love that, that, that project, it's called Today's Story. And what they did is they, they let uh, uh, kids in the kindergarten uh, walk around with a camera and a big bottom on their, on the chest. And they just told them like, whenever there's something interesting, push the bottom. So basically the, the whole, everything they did was recorded. And then in the end of the day, they used those snapshots to talk with the kids, like what happened. And they were able to reflect on a, on a much higher uh, uh, rational way because uh, the, the biggest problem for kids that age is uh, creating abstractions. They are not, their brains are not mature to, to, to do easily abstractions. But if you just have the videos, they can do reflection without needing to be able to do the abstractions. So they showed that that's possible. And then you actually have a video of, of half an hour you can give to the parents and they will understand every state of mind that the kid is in. Uh, and that, that was a very alternative way of looking at creating videos. If you today look at influencers and, and the way everything is about uh, getting people even more uh, um, uh, scared, it's, it's like 
the opposite of what we have today. Um, and I see the same thing with, with the whole AI debate. Today, today people are scared, but today it's getting serious. But 20 years ago, we did experiments with artificial life things that, that we wouldn't be able to even start today, but they, there are answers coming out of that 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 we can that we can still implement. So so it's it's so that's why when you were talking about the blue dots, it's it that's an important event. I mean, the whole thing about the Gaia hypothesis is about creating a simulation that tells us something. Even before we had climate change, we had a simulation which is called the Gaia hypothesis, um, showing how well, we always we always had climate, we always had climate change, but this climate change is started by humans and it's moving at a very rapid pace. So the, 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 the fact that we the fact that we, we could climate or anything like that, there never was any such thing, and we have to get rid of those ideas because it's just. But 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 uh, to to, yeah. to come back to what 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 uh, Mixel just said, what I find very interesting is in this experiment with kids, so to speak, is that you use a digital medium to enhance your uh, ability to reflect upon yourself. And I think we can also uh, agree, or we probably agree that social media is not exactly doing that. It's not exactly making us more reflective, but but uh, but, 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 but more that provokes us more than it makes us reflect in many ways. So would it be possible to use the digital um, uh, while striving for this garden of God, while striving for this, for this, for this beautiful future? And to make it more reflective and less, uh, 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 yeah, just just uh, a madhouse. Oh, I'm, I'm sure it's happening already. It's storytelling. It's film. It's 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 media everywhere. So I think the current critique, for example, of TikTok is that it's basically screwing our the heads of our kids, and it is. And it, overall, TikTok is a very destructive force. It's also a way for the Chinese to get data about our kids, which I think we should have been worried about a long time ago. So yeah. uh, there are better and there are worse media. Facebook fucked it up. That's what they did. This sort of be so. We left Facebook because Facebook tried to screw our heads without our admission to, to let them do so. And they employed thousands of psychologists to turn our children into addicts. Mark Zuckerberg has been a very, very evil person. So, the, mm -hmm. but there are, of course, things happening online. We're sitting right here, not making this conversation. Digital is fantastic in the sense that it removes space. It removes yeah. space. We literally live in a non-spatial world in the sense that we could talk to anybody anywhere in the world at zero cost today, and anybody can do that. Now, because it removes space, it makes time all the more precious. And that's exactly why history is more interesting than ever before. And what we're talking about processes and events, remember, process and events are all about the time. It's all about the time axis. It's about different types of time. It's about circular time, linear time, and how we think both the circular time and linear time and how to think in both to make this work. So this is what we philosophers do. We increasingly, after Hegel, philosophy has completely gone into a philosophy of time. Heidegger, Nietzsche, everybody is philosophy of time. Eastern spirituality, totally philosophy of time. I'm reading Japanese philosophers at the moment, catching up with Japanese 20th century philosophy, all about time. We stopped doing space when the telegraph arrived simply because space was the non-issue. The only space we're really worried about is the one outside of our planet, but it doesn't really affect us because we're actually stuck on this planet and the problems are here to be solved. And whatever happens in outer space, besides the satellites that are actually just checking in with us, it's all happening here. Planet Earth is still the scene. This is where everything is happening that is concerned to human beings. And now this planet has to be saved for human habitation. That is the overall event. So th th this, this is what we have to work with and stay with, stay focused exactly. on, I think. And of course, we are in a didactical process developing different types of digital media. And I'll tell you what, people do not want to be addicts. They don't want the children to be no. addicts. They no, don't want to have just, to, jump, to jump into their... there because there's something that really fits they your They really uh, are. I, and that, yeah. I, that's why I believe there'll be a dialectical movement towards a personal algorithm that you control rather than you being controlled by... Exactly. I, let yeah. me just finish that because I was going to say more or less that. I use perplexity at the moment a lot. It's basically an AI uh, uh, a tool to, to basically surf the internet. So basically Google, but then AI powered, right? And a lot of people are, young people are very enthusiastic about it because they say, I'm able to basically surf the web and, and surf uh, YouTube and surf uh, 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 Facebook, but I I am not in the in the in the in the power of the algorithm anymore, and I can ignore all the all the ad advertisements etc. So they have they're using this 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 tool basically as uh, an algorithm that, that will probably end somewhere soon when when people found out it it it's, it's bad for their for their business. Uh, 
if people uh, uh, can get content that way without uh, all the advertisements and without all the, all the algorithm that's try to enslave them basically. But it's very interesting that young people explain to each other on YouTube how you can use this AI tool to not get your content as YouTube serves it up, for example, but you can uh, pick that, and choose yourself. Let's let's make a difference between advertising and algorithms. It's very different thing. They're using an algorithm to protect themselves against another algorithm. That's what they're doing. That's how the tools work. So yes. algorithm, algorithm is again a neutral pharmacon. The algorithms we have today have been designed by big American tech companies, essentially, and they've been designed to make money both from us and from the people who mm -hmm. put the ads there. Mm -hmm. Now the problem for them is that we don't want the ads. We want the algorithms to tell us where the quality is. And the people who have the quality don't necessarily the ones who desperately throw money at advertising. So what they have is a conflicting situation. What Google did smartly was that they basically warned us that this is sponsored or this is an ad, meaning this person is desperate and tries to communicate with you, but you can ignore it. Because if you just go further down, skip the sponsorship and skip the ad, you actually get to what the algorithm really tells you is the answer to your question. For example, which is the best restaurant in Eindhoven that I should go to tonight according to my own budget? Now, that's a typical algorithmic question. Now, what we need, though, and we want, if we're all asked here, the three of us are asked, you want an algorithm that reflects you and challenges you in the way that you want to be challenged. Exactly. Now, you don't want the algorithm to be controlled by Google or Facebook. You want exactly. to be controlled. And that's where we're going to go with AI, too. We want the yeah. AI, AI to be personal so the AI is not used by somebody in power to control us. Now, yeah. this is going to be a huge dialectical issue over the next, say, 20, 30 years. We're going to go back and forth with these things. We're going to have tech companies and governments that try to control our minds. And this is what I'm warning when it comes to ecology. I don't buy into doing ecology as a moralistic issue where you nudge people without them knowing. I think it's going to backfire immensely. I think yeah. you need to work directly with people, make them conscious of what they're doing, and therefore they accept that they're doing what they're doing, and then therefore it's okay. I, yes, I, I don't so, so, so just I, to re it, ecology will make a terrible mistake if it turns. Yeah, yeah. Normal. And just to re reiterate what I was, uh, so I, I completely agree agreeing with you. So I, I was saying like I think we're at the moment where we're aware that we can be nudged, but we want to know and do this. Uh, we we want to be in control of the nudging, yes. or maybe even in some cases we want to ask somebody else to do some nudging, but we know exactly what the nudging will be. And if we've asked for it, for example, a sports coach or something, he will drive us to maybe work a little bit harder and, and give us some 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 morale speech or a loud music or whatever. And we know he is he is he's sort of trying to manipulate us and we think we're it's fine because we know what you're doing. We signed up for this. So then again you know what you're signing up for. So I think AI, uh, uh, it's super interesting that we now get sort of separate AI companies that say, my product is that I'm going to give you an algorithm that you want. You can design it. You can pay me for making an algorithm that you want. That's all I'm doing. It's like a bank who says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, to use your money to pay things for you. And my main money-making scheme, or well, part of it is, is using your money to make more money, but you can forget about that. We're doing this sort of behind the scenes and it doesn't matter where your money comes from, more or less. But mostly our money model is you pay us 10, 20, 30 euros a month and a, a, a little sum per transaction. And then we are going to do a transaction for you. We're there for you. And once you think, hey, this bank is not really having my interests in mind, you change banks. As soon as you see that, you change banks. And wouldn't it be nice if we had AI algorithms, companies that basically did the same. Then they serve the internet for us. They say, ah, okay, this is junk, this is junk, this is sponsored, this is sponsored, blah, blah, blah. I think this is stuff you were looking for. But I yes, think it will be very hard for companies to, to swallow that because their whole money making model is now gone. Yeah, and of course, the big tech companies now love regulation because they want regulation to keep new competitors out. Yeah. Watch out, watch out. So these are the major struggles. Of course, we philosophers work with this all the time. How are you going to get around this? So what I do, I talk directly to people in my work, and I say, how about your algorithm? How about your children's algorithm? How about your AI, personal AI? How about your yeah. children's AI? What kind of personal AI does your children want? And I arrive at something that I call, I want to be an encultured human being. Education even is wrong here, because education is still that if somebody educates you for their purpose. It was still about learning how to become a good factory worker for the factory owner. That was education. Enculturation means that I am encouraged to learn more things about the world every day I wake up. 
And that's deeply human. You don't have to motivate people to say, would you like to learn more about the world every day you wake up? Yeah, they would say yes. Okay. So being an uncultured human being is what I want my AI to do with me. Not controlled by somebody to consume something which is ultimately exploitative on the planet. Right? I don't want that. We're over consuming already. So I, I, I think a culture of human beings is what we want to be. My work is definitely geared towards that. I get uh -huh. wide support from people. And they, in my work, they, get, they become aware of how manipulated and how controlled they are and yeah. how they don't want to be controlled and manipulated. And this is why I'm totally against environmentalism going down the moralistic route trying to control people's minds. I think this incredibly dangerous path God thinks is wrong. And it also will lead to backlashes of the immense. I'll give you a perfect little example. If I drive a car and the car uses gasoline and I hear that there's something wrong with me driving a car when the real problem is that I'm using gasoline, which is pollution. Now, if the pollution is the problem, as a car owner, I will listen to you because you then have an ethical, you have an ethical case because I'm using gasoline to drive the car and it's polluting the planet, right? I'm burning fossil fuel, essentially. Now, if there's something wrong with me just driving the car itself, and people go after me for driving a car. I'm going to go aggressive about it because that's not the point. The point was the pollution problem. So if you don't, if you try to address something else but the actual problem, I think you're really in dangerous territory. You're a bit like the advertisers that we hate these days when we try to search on Google. We hate ads, but we also hate false messages. And I think exactly. to say with an authentic long-term message and do ecology properly is what I'm totally advocating. Stay yeah. authentic in a bit. Stay with the truth, no matter what you do. Don't overdo things or try to go for sensations because it's going to backfire. I think you just have to logically stay with the scientific facts and be authentic when you're going towards ecology and then believe that actually innovation is the way out. Yeah, and I hope that especially younger peoples are learning how they are manipulated, are disliking it, and, and therefore create some sort of uh, immune system against it maybe even much more than than uh, when we were young and uh, ads were a kind of a, oh they a are they are a common term among 19 year olds today oak is that they don't sales pitch me it's like when they hear somebody try to sell them a message like if you try to sneak underneath a message to get into their head they are allergic to it they hate it because that's exactly how social media is trying to dictate how they should see the world and how, how do they call that they're becoming a word don't sales pitch me Oh, yeah. Sales pitch. Don't sell pitch pay, right? Don't sell something to me that you try to sell without making me first aware of what you're doing. Rather, if you come into the door and say, I'm uh, going to try to sell you something, well, that's at least honest. Then I yeah. might even listen. But if you yeah, try to sell they're... something to me that I'm not even aware that you're trying to sell, you just go, oh, oh, I don't trust you at all. You try to sell pitch me. I'm out the door. And yeah. that's what kids are doing already because they hate these advertising companies think they can just sneak their way into you and nail you as a customer, right? It's so fucking devilish that people are going to hate it because I deeply Alex believe that humans do not want to be manipulated. What you're now saying, Alexander, is actually why I'm, I'm so, um, uh, I have so much belief in humanity, uh, which uh, uh, being a human, humanist is a pretty hard religion because you see people all the time making mistakes against it. So it's trying to keep on being believing it. But the fact that you see this kind of dynamics playing out where, where you see that when some kind of system is trying to kind of get you into a sinful behavior, and I mean sinful like the original word of a sin uh, missing your target, right? Um, then then, then you, you get that, this kind of behavior. And this reminds me about one of the things I like to do to for the deep digital research is actually go into kind of something new and then experience it. And during the lockdown, you had that three month period where Clubhouse was this crazy phenomenon. And it, it was interesting because it's a, it's a medium that we never saw before. It's a little, little bit like, uh, for people who don't know it, it's, it's a little bit uh, about a talk radio, but then like a social media. So it's a talk radio that it's more interactive. But it was interesting to see that uh, after a while, you just start, uh, if you're very much on that medium, you start, instead of like listening to what people are saying, you, you start listening to the intonation that is being used in this room. And you could very quickly realize like, nope, this is not a room I want to be in. And, and you just switch rooms like, like you, you switch te telev uh, television uh, channels until you reach something that is, actually has value. And so the, the, what, what you see here now is that, that the, the human condition is, is smarter than, than all the, 
the 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 shit they're trying to to throw them right yeah yeah i agree i agree i'm i'm going into human subjectivity next because i'm i've always fought against the cartesian individualism because i think it's actually the beginning of our major problems that we had during the light and this idea of the individual. i think it's dualism think human is beings the... are social creatures with individuals yeah. and, and precisely ecology since yeah. it's a shared yeah. problem we're all causing the problem and we must be all part of the solution is precisely the perfect example of a topic which you cannot solve individually at all you have to solve it as a humanity so that's why it's so <laughs> challenging and interesting yeah. we're, we're back at tribal poesis no yeah, trigger poesis, exactly. The trigger poesis. Yeah, that would work. What, that. Whatever humans create a value is always created collectively by a bunch of humans. There's no single innovator of anything ever. And this is the principle of tribal poesis. So anything starts from tribal. Anything starts from tribal and probably will arrive at tribal too. And the perfect example of that is to have had an exploitative capitalism across the world for 100 years and then realize it has now be switched into an exploitative system. And that requires a constraint that actually requires more growth, but the growth must go towards the exploitation. And if we can just make that event happen, we've done the job. Yep. Yeah. All right. <laughs> this was fun. This is fun. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, a lot of fun. That's one of the one of the things I really like this to, to to I think also end a little bit. One of the things I really like about social media and the internet age. That you can find like-minded people. I mean, uh, uh, in the high time of high degradation, people would have killed to find other it's people great. to talk with, to talk to that were so much, you know, uh, 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 like them in a way that they could. Check. And now we can just, yeah, have yeah, a, that's, have that's, a call. that's the principle we have for the global brain. And I, I, I'm to actually wrap up for me because I, I feel that we are getting into a wrap up scene. Um, and yeah. when when Alexander, when you're talking about this, this has something to do with, with the food revolutions 10,000 years ago. Um, um, I, I uh, one of my strong positions is that the, this concept of the global brain, which is which focuses on the human instead of the technological singularity that focuses on the technology. Right. Those are that's the alternative. Uh, but in the metaphor, they they see like people like neurons. And what, what I discovered is that, no, it's it's way bigger than that. And there are some other uh, scientists that, that point to that, that like it's a, we are not the, 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 the cells, we are not the neurons, but we are like the ribosomes. And there are like 10 million in every cell. So, so we, we need to think way much bigger. And it seems uh, to me that we are midway to this uh, huge innovation process that started 10,000 years ago. So I like the fact that we started with a historical view. And uh, as we are closing in to the center point of this mega event, um, it, it's kind of fascinating <clears throat> that we are discovering the, the real value of the human condition. So that's what I got out of this. And that's how I wrap up. That, by the way, thanks for all this. I, I actually enjoyed it with some snacks. To, to <laughs> it's like <laughs> me too. Really vegan meat. Vegan meat. In my case, uh, it's not. I'll have some lunch. coffee. It's a bit I'm early late. for the wine, but I'm gonna open a wine bottle soon. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I always wait, oh. wait to five o'clock. Five o'clock here, not somewhere. <laughs> Guys, I've enjoyed this conversation immensely. Uh, why not do it again? Uh, let this go to the back of heads and Mixel. Or mm -hmm. also for that matter, once you got the link, send the link to me. I'll spread it to all my social media platforms and just sure. people that I love this conversation. I think this was actually one of the best conversations on the college ever had. So that I'm really grateful. Really grateful. Yeah. I think I think if you're really up to it, uh, we can go much deeper and much more interesting yet. Because I think yeah. we're just finding out about each other, and I think there's a lot more there. There. Absolutely. Yeah. Nice. Yes. Nice. Yes. Nice. Yes. nice. Thank you. Big love to thank you. you. Both. Thank you, Mixel. Thank you, Alexander. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Mixel, for taking the initiative. Absolutely. <laughs> bye bye. I love your bye bye. 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 Bye.